Uh, okay, I guess we'll, we'll start. Um, yesterday, uh, we had a meeting uh, with a bunch of Cycles developers, uh, people integrating Cycles uh, into other applications. Uh, for four hours, we discussed a lot of different topics uh, about Cycles. Um, and I'm here to you know, give you a quick overview of what we talked about, and I guess the most interesting part for Blender users, uh, the roadmap for the next few months and the next year, and maybe a little beyond that. Um, so yesterday, we gathered in a meeting room. And even, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we thought it was a private meeting, but this leaked on Twitter even before the meeting was ended. So. Uh, so we had uh, a, a bunch of Cycles developers, uh, people integrating Cycles into uh, Poser, for example, uh, some people from AMD, from Intel, from Tangent Animation Studios. Uh, I'm probably forgetting some other people, but it, it was just like a mix of, uh, of people who usually are not communicating all that much, like all, the, all our Blender developers. Uh, you know, we communicate a lot, but then you know, the people working outside of that, there's sometimes some, you know, bit of lack of communication and, and so the purpose of the meeting was to get all these developers connected and uh, talking to each other um, getting you know getting them to contribute more hopefully uh, streamlining the process and uh, making a roadmap so that you know we're not working on the same thing and then and uh, you know finding out only you know months later um, so so just you know, a quick thing about the process for any potential Cycles developers that might be, might be listening. I'll get to the roadmap later, which I guess is the, the most interesting part for, for users. But for, for developers, uh, the communication will stay mostly the same. We'll, you know, we'll talk on the Cycles developer IRC channel. There's the BF Cycles mailing list. Uh, and we'll do code reviews and bug fixes uh, on developer.blender.org. But one thing that we're going to try to do is, um, instead of having a meeting, which might be difficult to organize because of different time zones, every month, uh, me or someone else will mail uh, a summary of like the changes um, that have happened in cycles or news or any relevant uh, information uh, that's been happening in the last month, and then we can have sort of a discussion around that on the mailing list, and which you know that might also be interesting to users. Um, so you know, just a, a few quick technical things that we talked about. We talked about a lot more, but uh, one is, of course, you have to do more code reviews, and we have to do, uh, help other developers integrate their code easier. There's a few patches, for example, from Tangent Animation that shamefully we haven't reviewed yet, and that have been sitting there. So we're going to try to prioritize that more, um, get those things in quicker. But we will also then, you know, on, on the other side, like them, you know, other developers to, to help review us and, and just uh, get a better dynamic going there. And one big problem uh, that we're also struggling with uh, in terms of accepting new features is that uh, with GPU rendering especially, uh, things can break in an unexpected way. And so we need uh, better testing for that. And so. What we really want to try to set up is you know, automated tests uh, for finding bugs and for finding performance issues, um, which can run every night, hopefully on multiple GPU models, maybe not initially. Uh, it might be a little bit difficult to set up. But then hopefully we'll get to, into a situation where you know, right now it often happens that someone makes a change and then it breaks on this weird GPU model uh, on a particular operating system. And hopefully we can we can try to solve that kind of problem because we're still having a lot of problems with AMD GPUs and some particular uh, NVIDIA models, which uh, I guess users are also experiencing. So we'll try to get that more, more stable. Um, and the other thing that we're going to do is um, just update the documentation for the developers so it's easier to get involved. So uh, the roadmap, which uh, I think is the most interesting part for users. So the roadmap is not like a promise that we'll do this. You know, it's just, uh, uh, and even like even worse, I'm standing here, you know, telling you what we're going to do, or maybe going to do, or hoping to do, but I'm not actually going to be implementing any of this stuff myself uh, because I just do like code reviews and bug fixing. So um, you can blame me for over promising um, if that happens, but. Um, 
So there's a bunch of features in the pipeline that are almost ready, just needs a, need a couple of, of changes and that we can expect to have in the next few months. I think two of these actually got committed this weekend, so it's a little outdated, but uh, like one, one of the big things that's almost ready is the, is the Disney BSDF, which is a, a surface shader, sometimes known as a PBR shader, uh, which, has, which combines like a lot of different components. It combines diffuse and specular and subsurface scattering and glass, and you can make like a whole range of materials with it, which is one shader node which I think is going to help uh, simplify shader networks a lot. Uh, and that was developed by uh, Pascal Schoen, and he did an amazing job there. I think in the, ne in the next few weeks we'll, we'll have that uh, in the development version. Uh, one other thing that's coming is the Shadow Catcher. <laughs> yeah. That was written by Sergey. Uh, there's a few kinks to work out there still, but I think we're, we're very close now. That, that patch has been available for a while, but I think we'll really, you know, this time we'll really have it, I hope, uh, very soon. Um, and then there's a bunch of work by, by Lucas, uh, who, you know, I guess as, as some people might know, he has like, uh, he's done a ton of great contributions to cycles. He has a lot of great work, some of which has been committed and some not yet. And there's a few things which are, almost ready, uh, which one is the IES lights, uh, which lets you load a, a file uh, that describes a particular light emission shape uh, and then you know, render that in cycles. Um, there's a metallic BSDF, which allows you to render uh, certain types of metal with, with really nice looking Fresnel effects. Um, there's a light sampling threshold, which got committed, I think, a few hours ago. Um, which is a, a really good optimization for uh, scenes with many lights. And uh, I mostly as a user, you might not even have to be aware of that, but if you have a scene with many lights, uh, that just can give you a really nice speed up pretty much automatically. Um, and then the big one that I guess uh, has been very popular is the denoiser, which uh, he has been working on over the summer. Uh, initially, I think the first version of that uh, will be you know, mostly for still images, not yet for animations. Um, there's a few kinks to work out there still, and we still have to review it, but that's, that's I think, quite high priority uh, for us. And then another thing that already, was already committed yesterday, I think, uh, are better texture coordinates for lights, and that was done by Lucas, uh, and also partially by, uh, you know, half of that was done also by developer uh, from who integrated uh, Cycles into Poser. And another uh, feature coming from uh, the Poser integration of Cycles is the ability to use um, main memory um, for rendering on NVIDIA graphics cards, which means you can actually uh, store you know, much bigger scenes than that, that might not fin fit on your GPU. Uh, and I think that's, yeah. <laughs> So that, that seems uh, that will be a quite popular feature. Um, so then we're going to get into a bit more speculative stuff. Uh, probably we think it will happen next year uh, because some of these projects have already been started or there's you know, high interest among developers uh, to do them. Um, so one is the split kernel. Uh, which is kind of a technical term, but basically we want to uh, make uh, GPU rendering on AMD uh, as good as it is on NVIDIA cards, uh, or you know, get it up to the same standard, get it as stable, get the performance there, get all the features there. And uh, Mai has been working on that, um, and she'll continue working on that for um, the next year, I think. And uh, besides just uh, you know, completing AMD GPU rendering, uh, this will have some nice technical uh, possibilities as well once that's running. Um, that, you know, some potential optimizations that we can do even on the CPU or, or with NVIDIA cards. Um, then the other very popular feature, I think, from Mai has been the micro displacement. Uh, right now, it's in, 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 the blend, in the current Blender release, but it's as an experimental feature because it's actually unfinished. But 
people don't really seem to care all that much because they're using it anyway and making tutorials and so um, so you know there's a lot of stuff to finish there and hopefully you know over the next year we can get that uh, really stable um, and finished more. One other thing that has, is also interesting for other renderers is that uh, we want to do you know more flexible AOVs or at least in, in, in Blender terminology passes um, and. You know, it's it's a bit technical, but the the, the Blender API for this is quite limited, and uh, we want to make it so every renderer can you know specify an arbitrary number of AOVs, uh, which is something that you know uh, developers from external renderers have been asking for for a long time. And one thing that uh, helps uh, for cycles is for light group AOVs. Uh, which is uh, basically a way to put lights into different groups and then render them as separate images. And then you can uh, individually tweak the intensity of the lights or the color of the lights uh, in compositing afterwards. Um, one other feature that, for which there's already a patch from tangent animation is light linking. Uh, we haven't reviewed it yet, but I'll make that a high priority because it's, uh, I think a lot of people have been asking for that as well. Uh, so, so you can basically specify this light only affects this object, or the other way around. This object is only affected by this light. Um, and there's a bunch more patches from Tangent Animation, like I think they mentioned in their presentation, and we'll, you know, we'll start reviewing those. Um, one thing that I, I don't know if we specifically planned it, but our biggest weakness right now in ray tracing is motion blur performance. Um, we know how to solve it. It just Sergey or, or someone will just need to find time somewhere, I suppose, uh, to, to do that optimization for motion blur. Um, I expect it will happen, but I'm not going to promise I'll do it because I don't know. I just put it in there actually without him knowing, so we'll see. <laughs> No, it's not rocket science. Uh, okay, so some other stuff uh, is uh, we want to be able to render more uh, textures in less memory, and for that we need MIP maps and a texture cache. Uh, that will probably be CPU only to start with, um, but I expect we'll have something in the area, uh, at least you know to start. Um, we'll have a configurable working color space, which is... Uh, uh, which is kind of technical, but basically uh, it, it will let you render uh, images which uh, can be displayed well on, on, uh, on displays with a high dynamic range, and the light bouncing will be a little, more, a little bit more um, realistic if you use the, the right color space. Then there's network rendering, um, which Lucas has been working on a bit, I think, uh, and we'll probably have some kind of version of that uh, in in, uh, in the next year, uh, maybe still experimental, maybe with some limitation, I'm not sure, but uh, there's something working there, so we'll probably release it in some kind of version. And then, of course, the big one also for open movie projects and any kind of animation is going to be the denoiser for animation uh, that Lucas has been working on, which requires some Blender side changes. Actually, I think the cycle side implementation is already there, so... Um, you know, it's just one more on the long list of patches that Lucas is working on, so I don't know in what order he's going to do all of them, but, or when he's going to find the time, but uh, hopefully, you know, we'll get that somewhere in, in the next year as well. And then there's a few features that we as developers think are very important, but there's no one uh, committed to working on them right now, I think. Um, so this is halfway an invitation for people to get involved, or, you know, just a reminder for ourselves that, you know, or just to communicate what kind of things we think are important. Um, one is adaptive sampling, uh, which helps you uh, put more, you know, samples on a particular part, even to a particular part of the image that might be noisy, which can help reduce render times quite a bit. And ideally, that works together with denoising. There was an initial patch for that, but probably that will be changed, you know, a lot because we really want it to work uh, together with denoising. Uh, one personal thing that I think is quite important is we now have the Disney uh, shader, which makes it easier uh, to set up shaders for a lot of materials, but it doesn't work for hair or for volumes, and we kind of want a similar thing for those two uh, 
to cover those two cases, the shader that combines all the components. Uh, UDEM textures, um, I guess people interested in that you know, know what it is, but basically uh, there's a lot of painting applications nowadays that can output textures into multiple separate image files, and we'd like to be able to render those in cycles. Um, the biggest part of that is actually uh, Blender changes that we would need to do, uh, probably. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, volume rendering is kind of limited, and we would like to be able to render uh, OpenVDB files. Um, we would like to reduce noise, like to do performance improvements. Um, and then one thing that's also uh, important for production is uh, statistics from rendering. So you know we want to find out. Uh, why this render on the render farm took so long, why it ran out of memory, uh, you know, why it looks so terrible. Um, well, I guess not the last one, but um, basically that's, that's a really useful tool in production. But, um, so that's, that's one thing that we would like to, to have as well. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that we talked about um, during the during the meeting, which I cannot possibly talk about uh, now because there's not enough time, but we'll write, write up a more detailed report uh, and send that to the Cycles mailing list if you're interested. Um, and I guess that's, that's pretty much it. I don't know how much time we have left. We still have a lot of time. So I guess I'll just uh, answer questions. Thank you. So, oh, any any questions? I guess maybe feature requests uh, or. Uh, <laughs> uh, How soon are we going to get light linking? Light linking. I don't know. It depends. I guess I guess I'm the bot. Yeah, I guess I'm the bottleneck there. I have to spend time reviewing it. Um, I don't know. Well, somewhere in the next few months. That's that's all, uh, the best estimate I can give you. Stuff. Why does it take you so long to actually get the thing into, into Blender, even a, at an experimental level? Well, well, the issue is once we add something, it's difficult to change it because then you might break you know, all, all the files that have been made with the experimental version. Um, and generally, we do releases quite quickly, like every few months, so you don't have a lot of time to fix it before that. Um, I guess now with 2.8, we might be a bit more adventurous and accept some stuff, even if it's not in a totally finished state. But we try to be fairly strict and keep the code standards high and so on to keep it easier to maintain things. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's on. Um. Hi, I uh, just recently uh, tried to, to test something with motion blur and noticed it's not working. That is, um, you all know probably the effect that when you're filming some LED and you make sudden movements, you can see that the LED actually flickers during motion blur. And um, that's what I tried to simulate and noticed that uh, motion blur yeah. um, completely ignores subframe animations, um, at least what uh, co concerning um, materials or lighting changes. Yeah. And, uh, well, I, I was just wondering whether that's something that's uh, on the horizon or even possible with cycles. I don't know. I've, I've, never, I've never discussed it with any other developers, but I've thought about it. Uh, I mean, you basically want motion blur for shader parameters, in a way, um, which is technically quite doable. I mean, if anyone wants to implement it, I'll happy, I'm happy to explain it to them. Um, yeah, it's possible. I don't know if, if it's a priority for any of the developers <laughs> at the moment, but uh, it's, it's feasible. Um, OK. <laughs> I want to propose a new feature, maybe. Um, I'm a commercial photographer, and I'm missing a feature quite often. Um, it's um, the ability to tilt and shift the layer of focus. Um, so you can get something like a toy camera effect or 
uh, more control of the layer of focus would be nice. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of interesting thing we can, things we can do in terms of more advanced camera models uh, that give you more control. Again, it's, it's not something that came up uh, at the meeting. It's not something that, I've, that a lot of developers have at the moment expressed interest in working on, but I, I, like I, I'd be happy to have it in cycles uh, if anyone is interested in that. Uh, hey. So, uh, um, first of all, you have some very big plans, so I, I'm not asking for you to add anything to this plan because you you should uh, yeah concentrate on on this. But I wanted to know uh, how Pitex is going. Yeah, um, I mean we ca it's it's there's basically two standards now. There's UDIM and there's Pitex, which somewhat serve the same purpose. Um, and I. I think most of the industry is seem, seems to have gone for UDIM uh, textures. So in a way, I think that's, that would be the higher priority for us, because there's, there's probably more users uh, who could benefit from that. Um, but yeah, we could have PTEX as well. It's, it's, uh, there's, but there's been no, like on the cycle side at least, there's been no real, you know, real progress on that in the past few years, I think. so. I was wondering if you could make it so that um, the uh, material icons, they react to film exposure and color management. So if you work with that, and for example set the film exposure to two or three, um, then because you have, for example, an interior scene, the material icons, they are just white yeah. in your scene because they react to that. Maybe that could be turned off. Yeah, maybe report a bug and, and we'll right. fix it. Okay. Thank okay. you. At the meeting, you said there were people there from other products other than just Blender. Yeah. Are we going to see a, a cycles version number that we can track through versions of Blender that we can map into other products? Or are we going to see some features being enabled in Blender but other features being enabled in Poser? Yeah, so we recently started uh, tagging Cycles versions after each Blender release. I mean, I, when I say we, it's actually Sergey who's doing it. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so we do have those version numbers, but we also, a lot of those applications, um, you know, they have their own customizations for cycles, so the version number doesn't necessarily mean it has all the, all the same features. So ideally, we would like to you know, have everyone using the exact same cycles code base, but on the other hand, it's very useful for all those applications to be able to customize it um, you know, without having to synchronize with us. So um, There is a version number, but it's, it's not necessarily that meaningful, and I don't know if we can make it all that meaningful. Uh, yeah, hi, Brett. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you mentioned this uh, in it or not, so I apologize if you did. But um, you know the uh, exposure for the, uh, the color space? There was a guy um, online, there's like a little uh, separate color space thing that you can add into Blender which manages the highlights better. Yeah. Do you know the thing I'm talking about? I was wondering yeah. if that's um, coming to Blender already or... Yeah, so part of that is the configurable working color space, um, right, yeah. which Lucas has been working on together with Troy, I guess, uh, is the person you're referring to. And then, yeah, the other part is that it is mostly a Blender side change to have a new color configuration. I don't know the exact status of that, but I think he had something that was reasonably ready, and I think, I, I think he will submit it you know, to be included in Blender at some point for us to review. So. I guess it depends on him if if it's if it's ready, but I, I don't I, I think it's something that fits nicely into Blender, and I, I don't expect it to be something that's you know once it's submitted, it, it should be hopefully fairly easy to just accept it quite quickly. I hope. Okay, I would like to say two things. First of all, I would like to say a big thank you for all your hard work. We much appreciate that. You know, I know that there is lots of things. Yeah. Thank you. And I also have a question. Will it be possible to having cyclists 
modularize or split kernel to disable all its features because it is growing bigger and bigger and more complicated over the time. But sometimes we need just some simple functionality and maybe then having the possibility to disable nearly all that funny stuff will be speedy up. Yeah, so that's something that, you know, disab dynamically disabling features in the code is something that will mostly help on GPUs because, of the, you know, the specific way they work on CPUs, I would expect the overhead to be like a couple of percent at most for those kinds of things. So I don't... On, those, on the CPU, you would probably not get a, a big speed up. On the GPU, it would probably be bigger. Um, you know, for, for OpenCL, we're already doing this, uh, for OpenCL on AMD. And um, there's even like a debugging option where you can do it for NVIDIA as well. If you set like some magic value somewhere, you can, you can do it. But uh, I, it's some, I don't know. We'll, we'll, I think it's something that, that uh, we'll probably look at at some point, that, that optimization. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what kind of speed ups that would give us, but uh, it's, it's something that we'll probably look at at some point. Yes, we're out of time.